St Hugh's was founded in 1886 as St Hugh's Hall by Elizabeth Wordsworth, the principal of Lady Margaret Hall. She aimed to cater for young women who could not afford the fees at Lady Margaret Hall. She probably intended St Hugh's just to act as a satellite hostel, but our first principal from 1886 to 1915, Annie Mobley, seen in this portrait, was determined that it should be a college in its own right. Establishing a women's college in Oxford at this period took a great degree of courage and perseverance. The women's colleges were not officially part of the university until 1909. Indeed, they were only granted full collegiate status in 1959. In the early years, their students relied for teaching on the goodwill of tutors in the men's colleges, supplemented by instruction from the small number of women tutors provided by the Association for the Higher Education of Women in Oxford. Women were not granted degrees in Oxford until 1920, but from the 1890s they took the same exams as the men, but only received a college certificate to confirm the subjects they'd studied and the standard that they'd reached. The portrait over the fireplace is of Clara Morden, St Hughes's first major benefactor, who left college a large sum of money in 1913. She was a suffragette who first visited St Hughes in 1897, having heard a lecture on women's emancipation given in London by the classics tutor at St Hughes, Annie Rogers, and Clara became a friend of Annie Mobley. Her benefaction enabled the college to buy the site on the corner of Banbury and St Margaret's Road, and this hall, Morden Hall, is named after her. Morden Hall was originally the Morden Library, as can be seen in this group portrait by Henry Lamb, RA, of the principal and some fellows in 1936. It shows on the left Evelyn Proctor, who was then history tutor and later became principal, Edith Wardale, who was English tutor until 1923, who remained on college council throughout the 20s and 30s, and when this portrait was painted, was an honorary fellow. Behind her is Elizabeth Francis, French tutor, and at the head of the table is the principal, Barbara Guire, whose steady hand had guided college through a difficult period after a constitutional crisis and the sudden death of her predecessor, Eleanor Jourdain, in 1924. On the right is Cecilia Aidy, research fellow from 1929, who is looking firmly away from all of her colleagues. The other portraits show Eleanor Jourdain, principal from 1915 to 1924, and our most famous living alumna, Aung San Suu Kyi, Burmese opposition leader and democracy campaigner, who read PPE here in the 1960s. On our way to the chapel, on the landing at the head of the staircase, we pass a portrait of Miss Proctor and a bust of her successor as principal, Miss Guire. The chapel has always been at the centre of life at St Hugh's. Elizabeth Wordsworth founded it as an Anglican institution, and in its early years, almost a quarter of its students were daughters of Anglican clergymen. Both our founder, Elizabeth Wordsworth, and our first principal, Annie Mobley, were daughters of bishops. All students were expected to attend a set number of chapel services each term. Failure to do so was noted on their record and had to be remedied. The chapel was redecorated and refurbished in 1962 with a benefaction from Dr. A.D. It is unusual, perhaps unique, among Oxford women's colleges in having a war memorial to members who were killed by enemy action in the Second World War. Among the memorials to individual members of staff is a beautiful engraved glass one to Barbara Guire, done by Lawrence Whistler. On its foundation in 1886, St Hugh's had a grand total of four students and was first housed in small residences in Norham Road, then Norham Garden and Fifield Road. Clara Morden's bequest made possible the purchase of the present site and the building of what we now call Main Building, arguably the first standalone purpose-built women's college building in Oxford. Despite the First World War, it was completed in 1916 and then housed 64 students. The number of students rose rapidly to 107 in 1918 
and by 1923, St Hugh's was the largest of the women's colleges, with 151 students. This number of students could not be accommodated in the main building, and in 1919, the first college house, number 4 St Margaret's Road, was purchased to provide more accommodation for the growing student body. By 1951, as a result of the gradual purchase of more college houses, all of what we now call the island site, bounded by St Margaret Roads to the north, Banbury Road to the east, Canterbury Road to the south, and Woodstock Road to the west, was owned by college. St Hugh's has always been very proud of its gardens, whose design owed much to one of the early tutors, Annie Rogers, who was on college council from 1894 to 1936. As Custos Hortulorum, she helped to create a garden stocked with choice plants, often grown from cuttings. It used to be said that the porters at St John's College had instructions that Miss Rogers was never to be left alone in the garden when she was carrying an umbrella, which she used as a handy receptacle for illicitly taken cuttings. She was a leading figure in the movement to open Oxford University to women and famous as a tactician in the long process of persuading the university to accept women students. One of her favourite pieces of advice was, never argue with your opponents, it only serves to clear their minds. The sundial on the terrace is a memorial to her. In front of us now is the Mary Gray Allen Building, completed in 1928, funded like main building with Clara Morden's fortune, the residue of which came to college on the death of her companion, Mary Gray Allen. MGA was opened in 1928 and extended to the west with the library in 1936. As you can see looking at them, the women's colleges were designed to resemble country houses and to provide a more domestic environment for study than the monastic quadrangles of the men's colleges. The long corridors at St Hugh's are also to be found in the other women's colleges in both Oxford and Cambridge. Not very much to present tastes particularly attractive, they were reckoned to facilitate a greater degree of supervision than was possible in the staircases of the men's colleges. In this room we aim to recreate a college room of the early 1920s. On the walls are copies of material in college archives, giving a sense of a day in the life of a young woman studying at St Hugh's in the 1920s. Each student had a room of her own, allowing her a degree of independence and privacy that she was unlikely to have had at home. Students' life in college depended almost entirely on the work of resident students or scouts, who lived in, though usually in smaller rooms on the top floor which in the 1930s were often shared with one or two other scouts. Notice the coal scuttle by the fireplace. In those days before central heating, each room had its own fire, cleared, prepared and lit every morning by one's own scout. Also on display here are copies of the college regulations, which amply demonstrate the restrictions on students' lives. In the early years, women could only attend lectures if accompanied by a chaperone and could only receive men visitors under similar supervision. We move on to the library. As in other women's colleges, the library was developed in the early years against a background of restricted access to the university library for women students. Originally housed in what is now the Morden Hall, by 1932, the library had over 12,000 books and new accommodation both for the collection and for reading it was urgently needed. The new library, designed by Herbert Buckland, the architect of main building, mirrored the arrangement in Morden Hall with a gallery at one end. It is a fine room in the Art Deco style, enhanced with this magnificent carpet in 1999, when with a generous gift from the parents of Howard Piper, a young student tragically killed in an accident, the whole library was refurbished and named the Howard Piper Library in his memory. The library has, like college itself, grown pretty well continuously. 
During the Second World War, when college was requisitioned as a military hospital and students were dispersed throughout Oxford, the library continued to serve their needs and was also used by the hospital staff and patients. In the early 1960s, rooms on the ground floor were reorganised into an additional reading room, a room for the storage and study of periodicals and a stack for lesser used books. In 1978, the science reading room was opened and a law library established in one of the college houses. By 1986, the collection had grown to 58,000 volumes and in 1996-7, a major extension was built, now the spacious entrance room on the ground floor with a room for college archive above.